So it'd be great if maybe we could just have them here. So here, I'm trying to remember our calendar that I know we've designed so thoughtfully. Pretty full. <laughs> yes, very um, full. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can, uh, your session was a long session. It was so. all day now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did their video, which is like two hours, which I, yeah. I thought really highly of. I so mean, maybe that's an initial Maybe step. at minimum, you know. Make that available. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've seen that. And I'm assuming Heidi hasn't seen it either. So maybe it's just like an expectation of, you know, yeah. hold each other accountable to let, at least do that. You know, if there's things, major takeaways from you that you would like to share, maybe via email or maybe um, in a 30 minute session. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that. If, there's a way to do it at some point. It doesn't have to be done you know, by a specific time. But the presenters were very good, and they were very good at interaction mm -hmm. and with questions mm -hmm. and comments. And they knew what they were talking about mm -hmm. and said, well, I'll get back to you. Because, oh, they, they knew right mm -hmm. there. So, and they were funny. Mm -hmm. Which, let me tell you, that was helpful. <laughs> I imagine so. You're such a slightly dry topic. <laughs> awesome. Um, any committee liaison updates? Um, no, we're um, in. The Parks and Facilities Advisory Committee is up to their necks in dogs, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing because mm -hmm. uh, they are passionate about it and they're doing a good job. And so I just want to give a shout out to that committee. They're, they're working hard. And, uh, I think it'll be, a, it'll be a benefit to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Jennifer Hoffman. I'm the Chief Advisory Committee Member for Parks and Facilities Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. Um, with regards to the um, uh, foundation, um, so as you know, Heidi um, is going to be the liaison there. Um, we did have a night with the Hops on July 30th, which was really fun. Mike McMurray, who um, owns the Hop, is Hops <laughs> is on our foundation uh, board, um, and it was a lovely evening, very well attended by trustees and their family members. Um, uh, I also want to share that we do have a brand new executive director. Um, her name is Eileen Kravitz, um, and she will begin work on Wednesday, September 4th. And we will try not to overwhelm her, and we will welcome her with open arms. Um, she has tremendous experience in nonprofit management and major gift fundraising, and she's lived in Beaverton for over 20 years and has utilized the Parks District of Authorities. So that is super exciting. Um, and then, um, since we have this board time, um, you know, it's we have a new board, and there, I think there's some opportunities to discuss some things that. Um, that happened um, in the last year, one of them being board stipends. There was a really healthy discussion, a really robust discussion. Um, one of the things that I'd like to ask staff to do, if I have consensus from my peers, um, is to explore what was one of our options, which was to go to the Oregon Ethics Commission and ask for a recommendation on how we could even approach that topic. So it could be anything as extreme as you're not even allowed to talk about this too. You are absolutely allowed to talk about this. I'm guessing it's somewhere in between, but I would like to continue the conversation and in order to do that in an ethical way and in a responsible way, we need to ask the Oregon Ethics Commission. So if I have nods, I'll take two nods. Um, so were you interested in getting a staff opinion, uh, going for the full the, commission? The staff is rarely different than the the full commission. Or well, the, that and it's rarely overturned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it takes a heck of a lot less time. Yeah. I think it was five to seven weeks mm -hmm. in that range versus six months. Okay. So I'm, because the history is that it hasn't often been overturned and we're doing our due diligence, I'm okay with going to the staff approach. Yep, perfect. And right. it's just, to, to have to have the tools to have the conversation because right now we don't have those tools. Um, Perfect. So I'd like to ask that to you. Yeah. I have something also. Um, so I think you're all familiar. Oh, I served on the budget committee this past year. One of the things that was um, very interesting to me was our STC methodology. So I would love if we could do some more research on how Ben Parks. Um, implemented their support of affordable housing, right, and learning more about how and what they did, and also then to look at our options in the SCDC methodology um, and the, um, I'm, I'm 
lacking a word that I'm trying to find, but a recommendation on what's available as options there. Yeah, I'd be curious. I mean, I, it's tricky to compare our part of Oregon with anyone else, but Bend is also similar in a lot of ways, you know, and they as a board, they've done some work around this. I know they engage their community. I'd be really curious to learn more about what they did, what they heard from their community. Is it waiver? Is it exempt? Did they completely change their methodology? Just as one, as one of our peers who's doing this work. Okay. So I think, you know, I, I've alerted Keith that, that, that we, we knew the subject matter may well come up. So we're, we're funded for consultant services. So I think maybe the clarity is um, at least some initial research, uh, survey work, what other agencies are doing, and certainly what uh, Ben uh, Parks and Rec did as well, uh, specifically. I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah, just um, we've actually had Janine arrange um, a conference call. We talked to the planning manager from Ben oh, to talk about their process and what they went through. And we got some good insights from that. Um, so I, I think the first step for us is if, if we're in agreement that we want to reopen the methodology, we'll move forward on getting a consultant on that. And specifically, we'll be looking for a consultant then who has expertise in policy level decisions um, rather than just the mathematical calculation. And that came out of the, our discussion with them that they, they thought that was really important. And so we would expect to come back, get, get the process done, get a consultant on board, and then come back. Um, I think the tenant that we target in December for a policy level discussion with several white papers to help us drive how we would structure that methodology. And is that policy that we do internally, or is that policy that we have to split for the state? Uh, no, it would be policy decisions for the district. There will be kind of a box around that that, like, is the state law. We have to do things right. in compliance with the state law. But within that, there are policy level decisions that the district can make <coughs> those regards. So, I don't have any problem with this, but what I would like to ask is the opportunity to maybe broaden looking at the options. Um, maybe look at, besides Ben, um, I know that there, I, this is a, an issue that I, I want to look at the methodology, but we also, I think you're looking at, at affordable housing and how we can maybe do that and how, how it would fit. So what I'd love to do is see what other, this is a nationwide issue. How are other places dealing with this. There, there's some bright folks out there. They're coming up with stuff. I'd like to know what that is. Um, and so I guess that would be one. And I think the other piece is I want to look at the options. Uh, I would love to have as part of this if we could get um, the list of options that we could do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's all sorts of permutations like is it all affordable housing? Is it only 30%? Is it all housing? Is it, you know, it, that would be one piece. Another is can we tailor options, for example, as you and I've talked, for public uh, benefit? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to say, okay, we can do this, but we have to have a return on public benefit? Is there a way to structure those kinds of things? So is there a way to... I feel like we need, like, I guess in my dream scenario, we would have, like, a menu that we could offer um, our, our potential partners that had, like, our, our dream scenario is something like Cornell and Murray. Um, yeah. But knowing that that's not going to happen with every housing yeah. development, but where but where are places that we can plug in? Where is it appropriate? Like, you know, there's been were there opportunities where maybe we should have sent a letter to HUD? Is that even appropriate? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that's worth exploring. <laughs> and I think we can ask the consultant to yeah, any on the research. That would be the intent is to have some discussions and, and have a series of white papers and discussions about these policy decisions and then use that to frame how the methodology gets put together. So it's, it's better to have those discussions in the abstract okay. before they frame it. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Very good. Any other bullet time? Anybody with that? Anything? Any more homework? Yeah. <laughs> business gentlemen we've got, we've got a couple updates and then uh, i do want to uh, brag a little bit about our <laughs> new management report which is in the packet but we'll we'll get there when we get there <laughs>
Uh, the first up is security operations, and Mark uh, Pierce, our manager of security, will give us an update. And Cameron, do you want to introduce Cameron in his role? This is Cameron. Cameron Hall. He's a uh, parks maintenance specialist, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get to him in a, in a second when we talk about Shopper. Um, so, again, I'm Mark, and I think I've met everyone. I had a pleasure meeting you all, so I appreciate you giving me a few minutes. I came on board in January, and uh, so uh, about eight months in. So, uh, on the slide that, that you see in front of you, I see some of the park patrol team that worked at Big Truck Days a couple weekends ago. And you may or may not notice that they are in uh, new uniforms. Uh, so they changed their, we changed their look a little bit. Uh, we rolled that uh, change out about a month ago. And so the team had uh, a big say in, in what we went to, and, and this is what they decided they liked, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on it. And so they, they look uh, much less like our law enforcement partners and, and much more like security operations personnel. So, so, so far we've gotten great feedback from that. What we're here to talk about, uh, between uh, April 1st and June 15th of this year, um, both Shipler and Mountain View Parks uh, experienced higher levels of graffiti and vandalism than the normal for that time frame. And as you can see from some of the photographs, and we'll look at a few here, uh, the amount of graffiti at both sites is pretty extensive. That type of activity is not really unusual during this, this time period of the year. But with that said, uh, certainly we want you to understand that we take all of those issues very seriously from a security operations standpoint. So following a pretty active spring at both parks for security and maintenance departments, um, we experienced, uh, or we're moving into summer, We've experienced lower levels of, of vandalism and graffiti at both parks. So it's tapered off significantly uh, since April through June. Uh, some of the reasons that we believe uh, uh, are responsible for that, for that are, um, especially with parks that are adjacent to schools, high schools and middle schools like these two parks uh, are. Uh, certainly warmer, improved weather, encourages a rise in truancy. We get increased uh, amounts of daylight, and that encourages later after hours use of some of the parks. And then, you know, the kids get a little amped up and excited about the end of the school year. So uh, they they tend to, and along to the summer vacation, they tend to, uh, to maybe do some things that are, that are a little more out of the ordinary. Some of the graffiti that we experienced had possible gang uh, influences and affiliations, and some of it was just simply kids calling each other names. Uh, so kind of the full, the full spectrum there. And so these types of incidents are generally will result in a significant number of hours spent to document, investigate, uh, and clean up uh, for both security operations and maintenance staff and then some of our, our other partners. And so with that, going to have Cameron uh, speak for a few minutes about the maintenance aspect of the graffiti and vandalism and, and what that means to them. Good evening board members, thank you for your time tonight. Um, just like what Mark was saying, I wanted to supplement really what maintenance operations means for this type of response and how it affects our, our week to week operations. So for maintenance, we have a set service schedule that we try to abide by each week where we visit each park each day at the same time throughout the week. So we have a consistent schedule for ourselves. Patrons are, we can expect us in the parks and it just works well for planning. We know what we're doing each day. So in May, when all these events started happening, the time frame that Mark was talking about, what would happen is we would respond immediately trying to get rid of the graffiti. Um, and that would take me off schedule for the other parks that I was trying to take care of for the week. So we realized that wasn't sustainable when it kept happening week after week. So we came up with a plan um, to not be as reactive to the graffiti and just to get on a service schedule. So if Schiffler was a Monday site, we would just take care of the graffiti on Monday. So that obviously helped um, in terms of getting rid of the graffiti and taking time away from other sites, but it definitely hurt the time spent improving Schiffler and keeping it maintained week to week because some of the slides that you've seen, the first one that was all across the bowl, that one took me about seven hours that day. So. 
the full day given the process of getting the pressure washer over there, applying the chemical needed to get it off of there. It's an activity to do it three or four times. It's just very time intensive. So spring, everything is growing, everything is really busy. Um, our time should be spent beautifying the park, making it ready for our patients in the summertime, getting ready for our annual events like Fiesta this coming Sunday. But for this spring, that pretty much the entire month of May was spent for me cleaning the skate park, cleaning the basketball court, and just took a lot of time away from the other sites that we should be working on. So that's pretty much the, the maintenance perspective. Um, aside from the cost that the market address, it's pretty much just our time. And our time is very valuable because we want to make sure that we deliver good park services for every one of our sites, not just one. All right, thank you, Cameron. So so then that brings us to kind of how our what our response looks like to these types of incidents and, and we certainly partner with a number of, of agencies uh, and entities both internal the THDRD and, and external so uh, number one on that list is certainly maintenance operations uh, to, to address the cleanup and repair uh, of our facility we also continue to collaborate with our IT department to, to discuss and explore the possibilities and potential to use cameras at some of these locations. Uh, security operations is also continuing its partnership, uh, long standing and very strong with, with the Beaverton Police Department and, and the Washington County Sheriff's Office to develop information that will, that will assist both agencies with their active investigations into these incidents. Uh, to date, regarding some of these incidents, we've been able to provide on scene personnel support, video, and still photography information and then also some persons of interest information for both of those law enforcement agencies. And we have uh, we've also been in very close contact with school resource officers at both locations and they are actively involved with us on a regular basis both during the school year and during summer break and, and that is because many of the students uh, who attend those schools uh, frequently parks during school hours so so we are we're interacting with school resource officers uh, virtually every day during the school year the continued coordination uh, between security operations and law enforcement is very critical to the success of, of any response to these incidents and we uh, THPRD remains committed to fostering that close and cooperative working relationship so we we work extensively with our partners the other piece of that response involves our community engagement. And so in April, uh, as all of this activity started ramping up around Shipler, Park Patrol can, and myself conducted a neighborhood canvas around Shipler Park to notify neighbors of the issues um, and also ask for their assistance in reporting suspicious activity. And that just involved us knocking on every single door that was adjacent to or across the street from the park uh, all the way around. Myself and Holly Thompson attended the Central Beaverton uh, NAC in May to discuss the ship of concerns and to ask for their input on addressing these issues. I think as a result of that meeting in July, a small group of THPRD staff uh, conducted a community meeting at the Shipper Skate Park and Gazebo. And I think we had a, probably a handful of families represented there. The community input received at that meeting included proposals to remove the gazebo entirely, to begin renting the gazebo again, to establish a dog park, uh, and other amenities uh, that uh, that would go at the site. And we even had one person who suggested live streaming a video feed from from some of our problem areas. So uh, the again the the suggestions from the community really ran the gamut. A, a lot of good ideas. Uh, probably the thing that we remember most, I think, Polly was uh, one of the neighbors said we we support pugs, not drugs. <laughs> so, uh, so that kind of stuck with us a little bit. Uh, so hence the uh, the dog park uh, talk and activity uh, over around Shepherd. So based on that information that we gathered, uh, we will be uh, tabling and also having a pop up dog park, I guess, at, at Fiesta this Sunday. Uh, at that location to ask neighbors for their input on the possibility of establishing a dog park there. And we'll also be following up with a mail survey to those area neighbors. 
to get their input. And so at the end of the day, the, the district and security operations are going to be very vigilant, dedicated to the cleanup and thorough investigation of all these incidents uh, through collaboration with our law enforcement partners, with our staff members, uh, and uh, most importantly, our patrons with the ultimate goal of reducing these concerns district-wide. We believe that the continued pursuit of that goal helps us push farther down that path of, of true access for everyone. People are not hesitant to, to go into our parks because they have fears of anything. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, first of all, thank you both for being here this evening. Um, I wanted to say that I had the opportunity to meet Cameron on site quite a while ago now. Um, and he gave me a great tour of Schiffler. Thank you for that. And at that time, we were dealing with some graffiti and some vandalism. And part of the vandalism was the lights under the, the walkway. And you had a pretty creative solution to put them in. And as far as I know, they're still working. Is that correct? They are, yeah. Okay, great. He kind of made it hard to rip them out. <laughs> and I took them in underneath because he didn't have to bend over and work at it. So I congratulate you on that. It was very creative. Our building maintenance department definitely helped with that as well, but they got it done in the building, so it's good. And that's that's great. Well, I just also, at the time, I remember um, the frustration that you and, and your other partners had that um, these are kids that are over there from Beaverton High School during school day. And at that time, the resource officers didn't appear to be terribly interested in taking on this project of their kids. So I was going to ask you, Mark, it sounds like that's changed. It, it has to, to some degree. They, you know, and I don't want to speak for them, but uh, they, they feel like in terms of enforcement and, and what they have in their toolbox to, to help get these kids back to school, they are very limited as, as to what they can do. Uh, so that being said, you know, when, when we got really engaged with them, when we started ramping up, they saw that we were very interested and they became very interested. So, so I, I feel like we've gotten over that hump and, and I think that uh, because we have worked with them throughout the summer as well, uh, even though school's not in. So I feel like maybe we, we've kind of gotten over that hump of them not being too interested. They understand how it impacts them as well. And that is that carrying over also at Mount View Champions? Yes, same same thing. Uh, but it, you know, but at one school we have Beaverton uh, Police Department resource officers, and at the other school we have Washington County uh, Sheriff's Department. So, uh, so same thing at, at both parks. Uh, once, once they got engaged with us and saw that we cared about it, um, they took much more active interest. Well, thank you. And I also wanted to ask. I still have Park Patrol on my tele on my cell phone. And I'm, if I see it, if I see graffiti before I'm walking, I take a picture and send it to you guys. I'm assuming you still want that. Please continue to do so. so. Uh, that goes for everyone. We encourage all our all our patrons, board members, staff, everyone to do that. Thank you. Has anybody been caught yet of all the incidents? Um, some some have been identified, uh, but not prosecuted um, for for a variety of reasons. But at the end of the day, if, if we don't have someone that's going to come forward, or we don't have video, or we don't have an admission from, from some of the kids, um, it's difficult to prosecute them. But the school resource officers definitely assisted us in identifying the people we, we believe are responsible. And certainly as we roll into the new school year, those are the, those are the kids that are going to be on our radar. Um. I recognize that for some of the pictures, this might not work, but I know some communities have kind of taken like the artistic approach to this, right? And I guess preventative measure to even bring in like street art artists, right? And turn it into art and it deters um, the graffiti. I recognize like those are benches or like you might not want to paint the skate bowl, right? But um, have we looked at any of those types of options? Like, is there any other sort of kind of natural deterrent that also beautifies? And, you know, is there something like that that we've been looking at? I think all those options are on the table, and, and I don't know if, um, if someone from maintenance will want to address, but one of the things with painting the skate bowl is it changes the skateability of the surface. And you kinda, so you kind of get into that. But at this point, I, I don't think we're taking anything off the table. In terms of ideas, I think I think we're open to 
whatever works. That's cool. Um, so I'm a little confused. So is there's cameras there? The, the cameras I referenced are, are these temporary trail cameras that, that Park Patrol has that we are able to move around to trouble spots. Mm -hmm. um, so they they go up and down depending on, on where we're having issues around the district. Uh, so for part of that time, we had some cameras up at both Shipwork and Mountain View uh, that were just temporary cameras. What, what we're talking about now with, within the district is permanently installed cameras with signage uh, that would be ma actually mounted on poles and stayed at those at some of those following or, or high traffic locations. Do we have a well do we tell people that they're being recorded that they're watched? Uh, we don't have to by law uh, but uh, if we install permanent cameras I think we probably want to go with appropriate signage and uh, because I want to be because, conscious of what's a deterrent versus what's a gotcha. Right. I'd rather deter. Right. Um, and I think that if we communicate, you're being watched, um, that that could go a long way rather than, be, you know, we just had a, our DEI training. So this is a community that is often feeling attacked. These are people that feel marginalized, justifiably so. Um, these are individuals who, you know, when we, as part of our DEI training, we talked about the power of making people feel welcome. So these are people that do not feel welcome. Um, so then when we have cameras that are walk that are watching them and we don't even acknowledge that, I, I feel like that sends a, a signal that isn't representative of our values, personally. Yeah, I think with any permanent cameras, we certainly want to go with signage. Uh, and at Shipwork, on the cameras that we had up, a skateboard was continuously thrown at it until it was hit and knocked down and, and taken. Um, so I, I think probably the people that, that we tend to be looking for on that video are very well aware of the cameras are there. The general public, the rest of the folks probably not. Um, I just wanted to be mindful of that and perhaps that is a policy to explore around how we're communicating with our constituents because I don't want them to feel like they're being spied on. Um, yeah, but I want us to explore that. Yeah, okay, that works. Yeah. But I will say to Ashley saying um, I was at a um, community talker about, about nature and, um, and community and all that kind of stuff and a woman had mentioned that there was a bus, covered bus area that was constantly in curfew all the time and nobody knew what to do and there's all about these, you know, rapidly kids and everybody was playing and stuff, but, um, and they talked about taking things away, um, but that, I guess that, in the end, that hurts the community as a whole, right, because they're kind of shaming for a small group, but they did have a ton of success with the intentional art. Um, and so they said when like, that stuff went up, like it just plummeted because it's already, you know, your street art is respected by other street art and then like, it gave um, people a way of, you know, they uh, rotated it and it's not as visible if, if it does get um, re redone over it, but, and it's rotated and they, there's rules of street art, I guess. But um, yeah, so there, that's just um, my two cents of, I've heard it being very, Okay, we're going to have uh, uh, Lulu uh, by Asteros Jones up, a uh, cultural arts, uh, or cultural arts, cultural inclusion specialist. Talking about, Talking about artists. <laughs> yeah, just like that. You're now our designated artist <laughs> as well. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lulu by Asteros Jones. Um, I'm the cultural inclusion specialist with the Human Inclusion Department. And today we want to share with you uh, a quick update on events that have coming up that are part of our DEI work that we're doing here in uh, Cape Verde, uh, as well as all of the efforts that are being undertaken by Cape Verde to expand participation and partnerships in the region. So, uh, 
So So we have Welcoming Week. What it is? Well, it's an annual, as you might all know, a series of events happening nationwide where organizations and communities bring together immigrants and those born within this country in a spirit of unity to build strong connections across the communities and offer the benefits of welcoming food. Who's promoting this? It's called Welcoming America. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, that identifies itself as part of a movement of more and more communities across the globe that recognize that being welcoming community for all makes us stronger economically, socially, and culture. So they provide a roadmap and support they need, uh, they need to become more inclusive towards immigrants and all residents. It was launched in 2009. Uh, welcoming America has spurred a uh, growing movement across the United States uh, with one of eight Americans living in a welcoming community, so that's quite a bit. As background, in 2018, there were over 2,000 events in 400 communities during Welcoming Week, with more than 80,000 people participating in over 14 million social media impressions. So, Last question would be why we need it. It's very obvious, but it's just that the strongest communities will be ones where all people can take part in the economic, civic, and social life. Uh, and of course, all of these activities, places, uh, show it is possible to go beyond fear and even tolerance for a bright future for all. Then, this is a nationwide effort and how do we see it here? What's uh, our local approach? Um, each local approach is unique. Uh, it is Beaverton's fifth annual celebration. The city works as an umbrella that provides a space and spotlights of events that reduce barriers for new community members, immigrants, and refugees. The objective is to build bridges between newcomers and longtime residents. Beaverton's welcoming week goes from September 13th to the 22nd, and the schedule is sent out by post, and it's already online. And then comes THPRD's participation. So let's start with Conestoga. For the third consecutive year, they started in 2017. They've been doing a spearhead activity called Celebrating Ada Culture. Uh, the pictures are from Conestoga. It is a free event that gives attendees a taste of Indian culture and a time for sharing music, art, dances, and much more. For this year, we are branding five activities that we already have going on in THPRD uh, with one special addition. So for example, the Nature Center has two events. It's Nature Walks, uh, one in Spanish, another one in English. We also have the uh, 12th annual uh, Cider Mill Cider Festival that's happening part as part of Welcoming Week. And our newest highlight would be Welcoming Walk, which will be happening in September 14th. Uh, it's in partnership with Unite Oregon. It is a walk to celebrate our immigrant and refugee community members explore parks and natural spaces. This event celebrates the power of making new connections, getting to know your neighbors, and sharing our immigration stories to create welcoming spaces that belong to everyone. Uh, we selected Greenway Park. Uh, we have a great parking there, but we also have many, many different communities that we kind of all collide there. So it's a wonderful place to hold this first uh, welcoming walk during the welcoming week. All right. I don't know if there's any questions. Addition. Yeah, um, I'm really grateful for this, especially right now, and especially this year. So I love seeing us taking such an active stance on welcoming week. So thank you for your work. Um, as well as it's been a bit emotional. <laughs> I'd like to say that I, I had a chance to go to the uh, Celebrating Indian Culture last year. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful, the flags of color, all sorts of things. But it was interesting to hear different people's comments. And they loved the food. And it was a lot of it was, gee, I never tried this before, and this is really good. So I think 
food is such a central piece of this um, that anywhere we can do it, it's probably hard on a walk, but mm -hmm. anywhere we can include people and food at the end. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. <coughs> I want more things. <laughs> more things like this. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. And we wait for you there so we can work with that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, also, again, the highlight uh, at the end of your, uh, uh, your packet is the updated, revised uh, management report. Uh, even though Holly's staff and Holly uh, took a great effort on this, it, uh, all the contributions again are from the entire district staff uh, and conglomerated in a variety of categories. And uh, this tool actually was commented by someone who saw it over in the communications department as it was in process and said, well, is all staff going to get that too? And so, yeah, all staff will get this too. Uh, it's just one more tool by which to communicate. And I think this is a lot more helpful for us than the previous document um, as like a tool for us to utilize and how we advocate for the district, how we promote for the district. So I love it. Um, I have shared with Holly two things that I would love added. Not perfect. that this isn't perfect all, oh. already. And maybe this is maybe more metrics and dashboard appropriate for the future, but I'd love to see like one of our job openings highlighted. Um, and it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a management level position. It could you know, be a lifeguard, yeah. or whatever. Sure. Um, but just something like that we're in need of, that we have four members to advocate for. And then um, I, this one might be more uh, dashboard appropriate in the future, but like the scholarship dollars utilized, like how we are in that journey. We've pledged more. Um, how are we doing with that? Yeah. Um, but I absolutely love this. Not only is the content awesome, it also looks really nice. So, yes. Yeah. And if possible, Crossover or fast, which is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, you're good. Uh, it's okay. You're good. You're beautiful. <laughs> I, I loved it. Very eye-catching. Makes you want to read it. Awesome job communicating to Diana Rianne. Oh, great. Have I met her? Kudos to her. I hope so. <laughs> um, okay, so. That ends open session. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs>